Hi everyone, my name is Yanis Fakinyansha and I'm happy to welcome you to the second episode of Reprogramming Strategies for Self-Renewal, the festival of conversations curated and conducted by Spanish writer and journalist specialized in technology and power, Marta Peirano. We have found ourselves at the crossroads of an existential decision. Do we bring the mistakes of the Enlightenment to their biological conclusion or do we develop a magical capacity to self-renew? What are the ways in which we can repair our thoughts and behavioral patterns in order to keep us collectively safe? Reprogramming consists of eight streaming events taking place on a monthly basis throughout the whole year. The first one, titled Reprogramming Triggers, was with the American science fiction writer Kim Stanley Robinson. If you missed it, you can find the recording on the project website. For today's conversation, Marta Pirano has invited the American sociologist, architectural and design theorist, Benjamin Breton. We are in a hurry, even 20, 30 might be too late. We need to fundamentally transform our cities, technologies and ecosystems to ensure our planets keep supporting Earth-like life. 
But what does that look like? Our apocalyptic post-colonial fantasies obscure our vision. We dream of thriving under the impossible conditions of distant planets, but fail to imagine establishing better ones on Earth. In the book The Stack on Software and Sovereignty, Breton envisioned a model for a planetary scale computation, then used it as a tool for a new planetary redesign project, the terraforming. Not of Mars, but of Earth. In today's event, we will discuss the technical, social and political infrastructures that are required for such a project. Benjamin Breton is the director of the design research program and think tank called the Terraforming at the Strelka Institute of Media, Architecture and Design in Moscow. He is also a professor of visual arts at the University of California, San Diego. For Slovenian-speaking audiences, we announce the imminent release of his Terraforming, translated by Marco Bauer, for the Ljubljana-based Sofia Publishing House. Also worth mentioning is the release of his new book, The Revenge of the Real, Politics for a Post-Pandemic World, at the end of June for the Versa Publishing House. Also today we have with us in the studio some special guests who will take part in the conversation in the second half of the event. And as usual, we offer the online audience the opportunity to send questions, considerations, share links and comments through the web chat available on our website. Here is Benjamin Breton talking to Marta Pirano. Benjamin, Marta, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you, Janice, and welcome everyone to Axioma and the second installment of the reprogramming series, this extended festival of conversations um, about uh, basically how to sell for new a planet on fire. The topic of today's uh, episode is infrastructures, and we will talk uh, not only, but probably mostly about this 52-year-old uh, infrastructure that once promised to bring all humans under the values of democracy, but has become the host of this massive uh, logistical enterprise that registers every interaction, matches buyers and sellers, and while it does not produce much value, it does calculate every price. My guest today has described it as a planetary scale computation infrastructure in a book called The Stack on Software and Sovereignty, which I highly recommend among other things because it has changed the way I see the world. So I am especially delighted to introduce this author as one of the most extraordinary thinkers of the 21st century and welcome to reprogramming Professor Benjamin Breton. Thank you very much for inviting me and thank you for the kind introduction. Well, um, as you know, I want to talk to you about how this planetary scale computation infrastructure can be used for climate mitigation, for uh, restoration and management. But before, and first of all, for those who haven't read the stack, can you explain what it is? Sure. Um, the stack is a, a model of what we might call planetary scale computation. So first of all, instead of thinking of computation as a, a kind of object, that there are certain things in the world that are computers, certain things that are not computers, we're, we're instead looking at the history and present of computation as an infrastructure, an infrastructure that operates at planetary scale, and indeed an infrastructure that has produced uh, planetary scale effects, um, and in certain respects has even produced what we recognize today as planetarity uh, in, in, the, in the first place. Now, the book looks at this specifically in terms of the history of political geography, though there's other ways of entering into that question. Uh, and its argument basically is twofold. One is that the appearance of planet, the, the emergence of planetary scale computation has both distorted and deformed traditional Westphalian models of political geography and produced new territories in its own image uh, that in essence re redraws the map in certain respects and in other respects um, produces the territory 
uh, over which and through which new kinds of maps might be imagined. The second argument is that instead of seeing planetary scale computation as a single un undifferentiated uh, machine, we can actually, it, it, it is in fact uh, more complex than that. It is more modular. Uh, it is more uh, 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 distributed in certain respects. It can be understood uh, in, in, in that regard as analogous to the uh, network architecture stacks, OSI or TCP IP, um, as operating at multiple levels, multiple layers. And so in the book, I talk about this in relationship to, uh, that is, instead of thinking about it as planetary scale computation is one thing, we can see all the different genres um, of this, from smart grids to cloud computing to Internet of Things, to artificial intelligence, and so forth. Instead of seeing these as a bunch of different species of computing all kind of spinning out independently, they actually form a, a something more coherent than that. Uh, something more in, uh, interoperable, uh, uh, however accidental that process might might have been. And so the book deals with this at six layers, what are called earth layer, cloud layer, city layer, address layer, interface layer, uh, and, and user layer uh, that comprise this accidental megastructure, which I call the stack. I like the idea of uh, the stack being accidental, considering how complex it is. Um, I like to mm -hmm. think about it uh, after reading the book as, as as layers of skin, you know, that contain like uh -huh. different colonies of, of uh, maybe, uh, you know, including bacteria and fungus uh, that somehow leave off each other and, uh, and, and behave in ways that are not deliberately uh, coordinated, but works at the end, yeah. it works this way. Now, the question is, um, having established that layer that, that, that can work as a, as, an, as, a, as a dermis or even as a part of the nervous system of, of you know, of, of this, of this plan, planetary skin this, uh, and, and, and its events, the, the, the uh, paradox is how um, in, the, in a time with this, with this infrastructure and, and the era of big data defined by the you know, extraction and, and, and process uh, of, of, of uh, extreme amount, amount of data, how is it that we were not able to prepare for a pandemic or even, you know, um, how is it that Texas wasn't capable of preparing <laughs> their system or their energetic grid uh, for, um, for yeah. a snowstorm or even Madrid, but um, with less dramatic right. circumstances, I guess. So what's, what's the problem yeah. with that? <laughs> Yeah, it's an interesting question. It ones that would then, in that respect, tie together the 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 stack with the, the upcoming book, uh, "The Revenge of the Real" on the project. But let me let me kind of go through it quickly, step by step, and in, in, through your excellent question. You know, one way in which another way in which we might think about planetary scale computation in that sort of that epidermal form uh, is to understand it. Uh, it, understand it this way. Like if, if you were to imagine the blue marble, the famous image of the earth from outer space, and instead of seeing it as a static image, you were to imagine it as a kind of uh, very long movie that goes, you know, four and a half billion years in which you could see the entire uh, evolution of the planet. And if we were to watch this on a kind of extreme fast forward, um, one, you know, we'd see volcanoes and comets and, and, and continents moving together and various things. And at the very last, uh, at the very last few minutes of this of this movie, we would see um, something interesting happen, and in that there would be these these um, these hominids that would appear along the surface of the of, of, of on the surface of the Earth that were capable of feats of tremendous tremendous feats of abstraction, uh, aesthetic reason, technical reason, uh, allegorical reason, instrumental reason. Uh, and then in the very last few seconds of this, we would see something that, that would, is really extraordinary that we really wouldn't have seen before in the history of the, in, 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 up to this point. And that is the appearance of that we would see the planet, in essence, wrap itself in wires. 
We would see transoceanic cables linking things together. We would see satellites being launched, producing a kind of a kind of inorganic fuzzy cloud uh, around around the planet. We would see the appearance, in other words, of planetary scale computation, <clears throat> not just as a human technology, but in essence as a as a, as a kind of cognitive layer that has appeared on, in, and around. Uh, around the around Earth itself. Now, the question that that I mean, if the stack was a book that was trying to sort of draw the history of that of that appearance or the history of the moment by which we sort of realize that this has appeared, the real question to be asked, which I think goes to the heart of your question, is really what is it for? What what is planetary scale computation for? What what is the what is the purpose to which this this capacity for sensing and modeling and simulation um, that we produced, uh, uh, to, to, what, to what should it be oriented and to what purposes it should it be served? And we've oriented it to lots of different things, some of which are, are quite obnoxious, like the kind of, um, the, the sort of, uh, kind of uh, the surveillance of individual internet users trying to motivate them in, in, into clicking on on ver on various kinds of things and sort of monetizing this to be sure i think one of the most the, the most sort of damaging uses of this in at least in its early year has been not just not just the fact that it's in essence surveilling individuals but that we've used it as a way of modeling individual of modeling individual persons in the first place as if individual humans themselves were the most interesting and important thing that this apparatus could, that the planet could know about itself. Uh, and so, in, in, and I'll, I'll say more about the problems with that later, because I think understanding it in this way is also, in a way, the basis of my critique of some of the more conventional um, surveillance uh, critiques of, of what Shoshana Zuboff called surveillance capitalism. Uh, I, I think her approach to this leaves is, is, is wanting in certain regards. But more importantly, we can also look at things like uh, climate science. One of the other things that this that this apparatus has done is sh sh told us how that the Earth is warming. That is, to the, going to your first question of what it is that planetary scale computation might contribute to uh, the mitigation or our anthropogenic response to anthropogenic climate change. The first thing we need to understand is that the very idea of climate change the very concept of climate change in quotes as as a concept is is an epistemological accomplishment of planetary scale computation without the ability to sense and model and and, and simulate billions and billions of data points from ice cores and surface temperatures and atmospheric temperatures and to model this into the future and into the past that the simple concept of of the of the man curve or the keeling curve the hockey stick wouldn't have been wouldn't have been approachable. There's no amount of direct phenomenological perception of nature that would have allowed us to come to this level of a technical abstraction. This, if you to me, is points in the direction of the kinds of things that planetary scale computation is for and should be used for. These are the sort of the positive directions of this. Now, to your the second part of your question of of like. Uh, given the capacity that we have for, uh, of you know, the technical capacity for sensing and modeling and uh, and structuring huge amounts of information in this way, why is it that we are, in fact, so incompetent at using this apparatus for the purposes of reasonable self-organization and self-governance? And, and and this is this is this is uh, this is exactly the the question that. The question that needs to needs to be asked. I think part of it is that part of it is it is has to do with the fact that since the beginning of the neoliberal era in the 1970s and 1980s, there has been in the West, in the West, a kind of dismantling of the premise of governance in the first place. Whether that's through on the right, the idea that that market forces, that emer self emergent market forces, can in fact organize a society without without any kind of deliberate planning. On the left, it was a kind of deep sus congenital uh, suspicion of all forms of all forms of, uh, of, of authority. Um, and, and the state understood as as co uh, coterminous with, with state violence. And anyway, obviously, it's a it's a complicated story. But 
we've lost the in the West. There has been a sort of a loss, a, a loss in the capacity to actually deliberately self-organize and self-govern ourselves. And the pandemic, as I see it, was a huge wake-up call, or should have been a huge wake-up call. That that um, the most technologically advanced societies in the world uh, were, in many cases, not. It wasn't that we were technologically unable to deal with the situation. We were politically and culturally unable to deal with the situation because the kinds of governing responses that would have been necessary, the kinds of positive biopolitical responses that would have been necessary, uh, were, were, were things that we uh, either have uh, that we haven't learned how to do with these tools. And this has been a, a and this is something that we need to we need to learn how to do. Now, the story in in, in Asia is quite different. Um, and I think to a certain extent, looking at, as we begin to sort of take stock of the, of, of beginning to look towards a post-pandemic era and take stock of what happened, um, the differences in the success of the response uh, in, in, in the United States or the UK or Italy versus Taiwan or Singapore uh, or, or Korea are quite stark. Uh, and, and I think there will be a, um, a certainly a reckoning in that, in, in, in that regard, or should be at least. Well, I, I really like um, this connection that I, that when I'm listening to you, uh, that I make thinking again of this, of this idea of the, this, um, the this, this superstructure as an epidermis that, that the earth and this kind of PBS documentary that you mentioned at the beginning um, <laughs> uh, has yeah, grown. Yeah, the biggest nature video ever. Yeah, yeah exactly. But it, it, it kind of links with uh, one of my favorite texts, um, which is um, Samuel Butler Darwin among the, machi the machines, where he he, yes, he published it in, in New Zealand. Yeah, and, and you know how he he uh, suggests that we humans um, are just the sexual organs of the machines, and so. Um, the, the way you describe this uh, massive video makes me think that maybe not the organs, but the bacteria on the skin that allows for the for the earth to grow sensors that are sophisticated. You know, yeah. no? And and I also no, realize... I, I, there, there, there... No, yeah, please, please. Go, please go ahead. I can respond to that, but I'd love to hear that. Love that okay. Thing. Well, that was just a thought. But... Um, I, I also really like that uh, your approach to how this um, to how this infrastructure is being um, misused uh, in terms of mm. surveillance is not so much that surveillance is, is, a, is a crime against our particular uh, individual personal or civil rights as much as it is a waste of time and resources. Um, and this uh, goes back to um, this front that has been open in the last few years of recovering the data that has been that mm -hmm. has been um, um, extracted uh, with this particular purpose of surveillance. And um, and and one of the things that I really like about your particular approach is that you think this data is useless for the same reason why we couldn't prevent or prepare for the pandemic. It's not a technical problem. <laughs> it's more of a goals <laughs> problem, no? Like this machine yeah. um, has the ability to provide for a source of uh, immense um, 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 organizing power <laughs> for the whole planet and yet is being used for political for serving the political uh, ambitions of little countries all around the world so again mm. it's not a technical problem so I wonder how do you imagine that this that this collection of sensors and eyes that we have placed all over the earth but also on top of it and in the oceans can be with its protocols and everything can be reprogrammed, which is the name of the series, um, yeah. in order to serve that purpose, to become like the skin that we need to sense what's going on on Earth and 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 cure and 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 serve um, as a as a as a mitigation and and restoration and reparation mm -hmm. uh, process. Yeah. 
So, th th yeah, um, I, I think that the first part of your comment and the second part are probably closely aligned. Like um, the, the old the adage of, of humans as the sexual organs of the machines, in a way, uh, is 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 part of the is, is part of the answer to this the second part um, in, in another in another way as well. Um, you mentioned the bacteria uh, in the terraforming book. At the beginning, I talk about the the black hole image. Uh, that a few years ago appeared, the image of the black hole. And um, and I compare this with the blue marble, and I suggest that in many respects, the black hole image is much more significant, philosophically significant, scientifically significant um, than, the, than the blue marble image, particularly in terms of the way it positions and locates humans in a, in this, that kind of, that kind of planetary, that kind of planetary dynamic of the inter and intra emergence of biological and non biological forms, and 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 specifically, you know, the the telescope through which this image was produced is the Event Horizon Telescope. It was distributed across the entire surface of one side of the planet um, in different sort of nodes, and then coordinated as sort of little, you know, you could think of it as rods and cones, like in an eye or something of, of different sensors, right, to produ produce this image. And so in this regard, you have this, the appearance of something like a, a, a sensory organ, a very rudimentary sensory organ, perhaps similar to the kind of photoreceptors that begin to appear on early uh, oceanic species several millions of years ago, but a kind of planetary, a planetary sensing organ that begins to sort of suddenly open its eye. And one of the things that the interesting to me about that, how that locates humans sort of, you know, like we are the scurrying little creatures that live inside this telescope that nevertheless, because, you know, because of our unique capacity for sapience, we're able to bring this about, right? And so I think part of the the longer term implications of this is is not so much to see humans as um, you know not not sort of humans as separate from these dynamic sort of processes, but but the ones in which our reason and rationality and sapience is in fact one of the things that the planet is capable of doing. One of the things that the planet is capable of are are these are these processes of of self reflection self-modulation, self-organization, and, and, and self-creation. The question is, what does a kind of general sapience or generalization of that sapience uh, look like um, if it's not only localized to a partic one particular hominid species, but is increasingly also, as you su suggested, extended into um, extended into, in many cases, computational apparatuses, uh, other kinds of other kinds of infrastructure that are also producing kinds of sensing, modeling, and simulation um, kind uh, forms of prospection that we were otherwise uh, otherwise sort of uniquely capable of, but but and also but you know but ones in which we're st we're still we're still enrolled. Um, now to the question of sort of this reprogramming of this in in, in a particular way, it. it I, I think to to a greater lesser degree, it it is a question of a kind of, um, you know, it, it's a long term remobilization of this more fundamental of this more fundamental uh, condition of our, our of our uh, in, our enrollment and entanglement with these processes. And what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, it should be clear in a certain sense, the way I see it, we. We discovered computation more than we invented computation, and so one of the ways to sort of think about its development over the next fifty years, over the next five hundred years, uh, or indeed over the or, or or even even longer term than this, we have to think about that kind of dynamic as as one in which the processes, whether that's mineral sourcing or energy distribution or the social and cultural functions of this infrastructure are ones that are um, that are sustainable, quote unquote, on a much longer term scale than we're used than we're used to than we're used to thinking about. Now, more specifically to the the point that you made, um, again, part of the Part of the part of the problem uh, of the ways in which we have steered and oriented planetary scale computation in the last generation is towards the sensing, modeling, and simulation, and 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 um, kind of governance of 
individually uh, individually described uh, persons, users, user profiles, and, and so forth, as if the modeling of seven billion primates were the primary function of this of, of, of this apparatus. And first of all, the individuation of them, or, you know, the individuation of us, of a society into into high, overly individuated units in this way. This is this this is really the first problem of this. And so part of the question, the answer to your question of how do we reprogram this? Like what does this reprogram look like? Well, one of the more the most fundamental premises of this reprogramming is going to have to be a kind of disindividuation of the of the gaze, of the purpose, of the uh, agenda. Uh, of planetary scale computation. There needs to be a kind of Copernican turn, if you like, away from the uh, away from the over individuated self mirroring self mirroring um, that we that we've come to be accustomed to. Now, I, I suggested that 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 there is in some ways that 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 argument in some ways uh, is in concert with the conventional critique of surveillance capitalism. But in some ways, it, it departs from it, and it departs from it because, in many respects, um, the the more conventional version of that, the kind of Shoshana Zuboff or Naomi Klein version of that critique, is one in which the response to surveillance capitalism is one in, is is in fact a kind of re-individuation in a response, a kind of counter weaponization of the liberal legal individual subject. Who, who they see has been uh, manipulated or entered into improper contractual relationships with the platform, but that the responses to this should be a kind of counter weaponization of anonymity, a counter weaponization of, of, of a kind of privacy, of, of a reprivatization of one's own, of one's relationship with these platforms, um, and, and, and so forth. And to me, in many cases, the, these kinds of responses, instead of pointing us towards a logic of the de disindividuation of what it is planetary scale computation is interested in, they in fact kind of concretize or even accelerate the logic of of individuation, but do so uh, in in ways that are uh, in ways that are um, uh, are seen as a kind of uh, defensive uh, kind of counter de counter defensive response. And and to your point. The, the the take back our data, the kind of more su superficial version of the take back our data notion that we might read in a a kind of uh, agitated Guardian op-ed or something like that, is it is is predicate is the same sort of idea as, as if I mean first of all I should say I, I'm I'm a little bit uh, I'm also a little bit suspicious of the term extraction in relationship to data in that in that for the in, in a, at a fundamental level data is produced. More than is abstract, extracted. That is, data doesn't exist out into the world like strawberries, and we can go pick it up, or exist underground like petroleum, and we can extract it. And once it's extracted, like it, that, it's 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 already configured. And once it's extracted and taken somewhere else, it's no longer in the, in that place. That data, multiple kinds of data, can be produced about the same event or person or place or thing over and over and over again with, at, without the without excluding any of the other data models. And so this goes to, to your, the, the idea that somehow if we could take back the data that Facebook has produced about society or that advertising companies have produced about society, that then we would have the data that we need in order to perform the feats and acts of self-composition, self-organization, self-governance that we need to do because we would be able to use the data that they've produced about us if we can get it back from them is, I think, to, it is I understand very much the motivation for this, but ultimately I think it's misguided because it's the wrong data. The data about what about the number of people who like this cat video or like this thing or are agitated about this political post or, or whatever is not the information that that planetary society needs in order to respond in order to compose. And to build the 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 anthropogenic response to anthropogenic climate change, for example, that we need we need different data uh, than that. And so the, and so to underscore your point, 
part of the pathology of the situation is not only <clears throat> these are the negative effects of the system that we have, uh, political polarization, fake news, whatever, but also this we are using all of this we are using this technology at the exclusion of using it for the things we really need to be using it for we're producing data all of the things that we could be producing data about <clears throat> we're not all of the kinds of data models that we actually need <clears throat> are not being produced um, because they're being used because they're being used for other things and so maybe another last point on this is that um while as hopefully is clear, I'm, I'm extremely critical of the particular kind of individual surveillance uh, model that planetary scale computation is predica predicated on at this moment. I also think that the term surveillance to a certain extent has become uh, overextended in that it, it's, it's, it's put us in a position to where all of the, the kind of positive modes of societal self-sensing all of the potentially positive modes of societal self-modeling, all the potentially positive modes of societal self-simulation are, there's a kind of reflexive response to see these as just part of another surveillance regime and that we should reject on those terms. And in fact, I, I think the positive project for, um, uh, uh, for, the, for the, the reformation and the, re, and, the, and the reprogramming, as you put it, is one that's going to uh, be based on other logics of sensing, modeling, and simulation than the ones that we have, but but also ones that I think will will should would see uh, would diminish the term surveillance to mean something much more specific uh, than it's generally been than, than it's sometimes used to describe. Well, thanks for that, and um, and also thanks for your suggestion of a third Copernican revolution. I I really like this idea, especially. And this uh, Lynn Margulis uh, line that you have yeah. of us not being, not being the mo not even the most interesting uh, species in the planet. Um, of course, just to remind the audience, we're talking, you know, uh, the first one being actually Copernicus uh, demonstrating that we are not the center of the universe, then Darwin uh, demonstrating that we are not the center of the, I don't know, visible universe. The third one would be yeah. just admitting our role among the protozoic <laughs> creatures because you know they will yeah. probably inherit the earth <laughs> and um and i really like this uh this idea because it also suggests that the problem we have is not technical and it's not even political it's more of an emotional uh problem that we have with the rest of inhabitants of the planet like we insist in um, thinking and living in this planet as if we were colonizers of it and not a part hmm. of it, which is, of course, a, a concept that you and your students explore quite thoroughly in your terraforming uh, seminar um, to very yeah. interesting um, uh, conclusions. And um, the thing here is, um, so how, um, I mean, you're an architect, you have explained uh, also in the stack that in the architecture, the design itself of a system, there is a process of decision making that is political and that uh, mm -hmm. is tightly um, linked to its goal. So um, the thing is, how do we take all this nervous system um, uh, with all its eyes and ears and you know skin, skin bits and, and, and turn it around to uh to to look at the earth like what is what are the steps that need to be taken and i'm asking this with a bit of a selfish um uh objective myself because i've been pushing uh for quite a while uh, to 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 do something that uh that is pretty unpopular because it was not my idea but donald trump's idea i think a very good one which is something I'm not going to make a t-shirt with, but um, <laughs> I think uh, when he when he tried to uh, to make TikTok uh, company sell all his um, all its uh, American um, American uh, users. Uh, uh, sorry, um, <laughs> I was just reminded to remind our audience to please um, 
uh, remember that you can ask uh, questions or leave your questions in the in the chat next to the video. I'm sorry, I totally forgot. Uh, but going back to this, um, the 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 thing is uh, when when Trump uh, tried to oblige uh, TikTok uh, ByteDance company to sell the TikTok uh, business to the United States, so it could be basically controlled in the United States and, 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 and serve to uh, American users in the United States. The thought I had was, if Europe was to do the same thing with, say, you know, Google or Facebook, which are platforms we have, like, unanswerable proof <laughs> that have been um, surveilling um, European citizens without permission, we could turn those infrastructures uh, to do things that were actually useful for us, no? Hmm. Do you think there is a path? <laughs> because, of course, when we talk about the internet and even when we talk about the stack, we're talking about a way wider a range of infrastructures and protocols and, and regulations and, 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 and all sorts of other things. But uh, how do you see the steps, like the political steps towards that that sort of uh, infrastructure is serving this purpose like yeah. where would you so, start? well there's lots of places to start I, I think part of it is is one to understand that the history of planetary scale computation the the presence of planetary scale computation the kinds of things that it's, it's already being that it is being used for that it is good at that it, that it is contributions are not only um are not only the ones that are are that are c controlled by uh, commercial advertising commercial advertising platforms, and that's why my I sort of keep coming back to uh, earth sciences and astronomy and and uh, and uh, uh, biotechnology and other kind of sort of uses uses of this that are. That I think that that are more profound, that are really do will form the basis of the longer term project. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. one but way to think about this. For a second. But it is uh, SpaceX that is planting uh, infrastructure on space. <laughs> it is a SpaceX that is sending, you know, uh, artifacts to Mars. I mean, lot, lot, lots of people are. So China has, yeah. I mean, lots of. You've got China. The the China has the rovers on on or currently has rovers on the moon. Um, the rover that just landed on Mars was a NASA project. Um, but but you're right. The question of I mean the question of of space, which I'm, I'm happy to speak to because I think it's extremely interesting, particularly in relationship to states and the relationship between states and corporations in terms of space uh, and the kind of legal structures that are emerging from this. It, it will become an a really profound and, and important uh, point of contestation. But it, it, let me lead up to that in a couple of steps. Um, the, you know, there's certain kinds of technologies that they're more fundamental social, that they're really the decisive social impact that they have is, is instrumental, that they allow us to do something that we couldn't have done before. There's other kinds of technologies that the real impact is, is not, not so much instrumental, that it, it's epistemological, that they actually allow us to see and understand the world in a different way. And so, you know, that microscopes and telescopes are examples of this. Um, and I think in the long term, uh, planetary scale computation is as well. Um, and, you know, I think there were other Copernican turns along that line between Darwin, you know, neuroscience. I think AI will prove to be a kind of Copernican turn. Um, but, but to the question of, of, of this, you know, I'm actually, I would say that, uh, I, I, thought that I, I think that the, I think the Trump administration's attempt to, nationalize uh TikTok was was probably misguided i, I actually i i'm not i, I don't really I, I i'm not really immediately um automatically sympathetic to trying to respond to these kinds of planetary complexities through a kind of uh national through some kind of region nationalism or regionalism uh as 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 a, a kind of automatic uh, automatic response uh, to how how these how these might work, uh, I, I think that there is not only because in certain respects there's kinds of um, you know there's analogies to other kinds of, of of atavistic forms of political or cultural fundamentalism, 
uh, nativism, uh, and so forth and so on. That, that is, I, I think the planetarity of these circumstances is a given. Um, one of the things that planetary scope computation has done is not only produced planetary conditions, it has disclosed or revealed that, that the social and political and cultural uh, realities in which we're enmeshed have always been planetary to a certain, to a certain regard. And so in the long run, the project is going to also have to be planetary uh, in, in scope. It, I don't think just a kind of you know re, re enclosure around comfortable jurisdictions uh, is going is is in the long run going to going to solve going to solve the problem um, in the in, in tactical sense of ways in which, for example, you know with GDPR and in Europe where where, the, where there's there is a kind of leveraging of existing political structures to trying to reestablish the politics of data, for certain there are can be tactical uh, important as aspects of this. Um, one of the, the things about GDPR I, I find, though to be clear, I might find a bit troubling, is the idea that data is, is fundamentally personal, um, that personal data is, is something that needs, that needs to be understood. And in that regard, I, I, to be clear, I don't think fix, Facebook's is fixable. I don't think it's a matter of fixing Facebook. I, I think face, I think Facebook in particular, because it models society based on the this over individuated user profile, over individuation of of, per, of, of of users in this individual kind of construct, that taking back this data or preserving this data is going to be. I, I'm not convinced that this is is going to be useful in, in useful in, in in this kind of in this kind of sense. Now that said, what what other kinds of sort of planetary structures might be? Well, I think part of the longer project, and and we're, we've actually we're just starting a uh, a project next week at the Stroke Institute as part of the terraforming program on planetary governance, on the future of planetary governance, which may be um, which may be of interest to your to your listeners. I'll I'll, I'll post the links for this in a, in a moment. I, it includes a. Um, it includes an essay that a, a, a new essay that I, I've written called uh, uh, "Quote Unquote New World Order for Planetary Governance," uh, and includes an open call for for participants around this kind of issue. So, I, I strongly agree that this this is a this is a so important kind of leverage point, but it's also one that's that I, I I will try to hold to needs to be planetary in scope, not a kind of na not based on a kind of national uh, a kind of uh, uh, nationalism. Now. I'm also interested, you know, one of the things that, that you know, from the 2016 elections that, that, and with Brexit that people became quite alarmed about was the role of, uh, the role of foreign consultants, foreign data, foreign platforms, foreign, um, uh, you know, external players in the construction of what, were, what had previously been or would understand to be um, uh, sort of sovereign national political discussions, and and while you know Steve Bannon and his troops are 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 are, are not at all likable likable to me, the idea of something like a, you know a kind of planetary politics, a politics in which the there are common platforms, that there's common slates of candidates, that there are common kinds of of projects and projections that can be mobilized and organized across states, across jurisdictions, across the world's democracies as, 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 they, as they exist in a way that is transnational um, in the same way in which right-wing populists in 2016 tried to mobilize n a number of different kinds of elections around. They had this, it's very kind of ironic. There's a transnational political movement that's all focused on a kind of recidivist nationalism as their as the response, whereas maybe on the left you have you have a number of nationalist movements, all of which imagine themselves to have a kind of transnational implications or transnational vision, and and I wonder whether or not you know that that we, sh we this should be uh, whether whether or not th this should be this should be be rethought, but you know one of the other fundamental I think you know sort of strain is one of the fundamental things that I think we'll also look back at around the pandemic was this very peculiar sociological fact of once the pandemic hit everyone the, an otherwise mobile global population was frozen and everyone sent back to their country of passport 
a kind of musical chairs and then the music stops and the the Spanish were sent back to Spain and the Brazilians sent back to Brazil and the Japanese sent back to Japan as if this would some you know as, as if as if the condition of population intermingling across borders was itself the, a fundamentally dangerous phenomenon as opposed to inside of borders um, but also the idea that if, if that the that the way in which a particular person might be given access to the healthcare infrastructure that they would need, testing, masks, vaccines, uh, hospitalization, was only available to them in the, pl in the place of their country of passport, even though all of those things might be, or certainly should be available to them um, wherever it is, whatever there is that might go. And so going forward, you know, thinking, thinking, thinking you know, forward in a few years, the idea that you would have access to the fundamental services that states provide, that public services provide, that in many cases private services provide, regardless of your regardless of your location, should I think be a kind of uh, an aspiration for what for the kind of positive biopolitics that we are that that, that we're that we're imagining. And so, uh, you know, I'll just sort of say, you know, my 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 initial kind of starting point for a lot of these discussions is one in is one that holds that we need to rethink borders quite clearly that that the borders of what constitutes Europe or Eurasia or Asia or the United States or any of, the, of these kinds of things need to be fundamentally rethought and it may not entirely be about the elimination of borders then it is about making borders to a certain extent less relevant because the things that people would cross borders to have access to they already have access to wherever they are, uh, and so that can and so the condition of of, of intermingling and of, of flows and of populations uh, connecting with one another. I, I think this is a fundamental logic of what what human populations um, for the 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 viable planetarity to come uh, might look like. And so uh, I hope yeah I hope this is a little bit of an answer to your question about TikTok. I kind of went a little bit further from that, but that's my that's my. My statement on that. I should just recommend for your for the viewers who like TikTok, you know, TikTok is sometimes, at least in the United States, I remember when there was all the controversy about that, there was a number of people doing these like Chinese protest videos on TikTok as if they were speaking back to the Chinese government and were speaking the truth to the Chinese audience who otherwise couldn't have been sort of seen as without realizing that TikTok doesn't really exist in China. Um, TikTok is only, is, is Douyin is the Chinese app. And so in China, this is the one you use, and so they were kind of speaking to themselves, but imagining, uh, uh, imagining all of this. But um, anyway, there's an, another point. There's a whole other conversation to be had about. I think what's become a kind of um, an in, a sort of that there are there are things that the Chinese regime is doing that are reprehensible, and there are and there is I think what has become a kind of dangerously orientalist. Um, uh, kind of a, a, a sort of uh, uh, nativist fear of the Chinese internet in general that that have gotten conflated with one another in ways that are that the ways that are not not productive. I, I, I think in, in weird ways, I think one of the things one of the things we we see is that fear of technology, which is something that is sort of has been kind of endemic to. Western culture for for at least a couple hundred years, fear of technology has now become fear of of China. That fear that, that China has become a kind of face of the fear of technology. And so, where earlier tropes of a kind of faceless, emotionless yellow horde that's going to come and take everything has now been replaced by images of a kind of uh, emotionless, robotic, uh, sort of lo logistical people. Uh, that is that is quite quite uh, uh, quite unlike the reality on the ground as 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 as, as I see it, and and so again, there's another the relate part of the question that we I think is part of all of this is is the role of China in the terraforming project, the role of China in the composition of a viable planetarity that, that the, this cannot be a conversation that that the that the United States and Western Europe has amongst itself, as if. We, as if that that though people that those populations are going to be the agents of of the agents of change and the agents of history, uh, 
it, it's it's unlikely. And so the question around how to conceptualize a geopolitical planetarity, a cultural planetarity, technological planetarity, uh, in, in which uh, China in particular, China in particular, but Asia more generally, um, plays the leading role, uh, is 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 certainly something that's central to my thinking. Well, um, absolutely. Oh, this turned very political. I was I was hoping to avoid it, but um, I mean. I would like to clear that. that I'm sorry. Did I say something? I should. Uh, did I go in a direction I shouldn't have gone? No, absolutely not. I really like the direction okay. it took eventually. <laughs> but the thing is, uh, the 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 proposal had more to do with the decentralization of a network that involves like, hundreds of millions of people, and um, and and the idea that a planetary scale computation um, infrastructure would be maybe more useful if uh, the, there was more um, access, more uh, not only to its data or to its out output, but also to its management, no? to, to redistribute the mm -hmm. access to this uh, infrastructure as being important. But, but um, yeah. I want to ask you a question before <laughs> before we uh, which which is gonna which let, you're gonna let, have let me respond let me respond to that in ten seconds so that it's a little bit clear. Um, I think that the the the, 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 the sort of the ideal form of a geopolitic of a, the geopolitical and and distribution of the infrastructure and controllability of planet uh, and control and composition of planetary scale computation would be one that is likely more decentralized than the version that we have now in many respects. But it would also be one that is also capable of planning, capable of more deliberate direction. That it, that instead of it being a entirely emergent kind of process, it's one that um, actually has a kind of uh, a, a, a sort of self, a more self self conscious direction. That is, I think, different than to say that therefore decentralization is both the means and the ends. Like I think there are forms of decentralization that have also are part of why we are in a position where the capacity for self-governance is so uh, lame at this at this moment because of a, of, of a, a kind of deep suspicion on both the left and the right of, 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 of the of, of forms of verticality in general. So anyway, that's my parenthesis on that. Well, before, and I'm happy you uh, you ended on that, uh, because my last question, and you're going to have like literally four minutes to answer it before we uh, have to give, give the floor to our guests, um, is so when this planetary scale computation acquires or like the, the planning powers or at least the right to deliver um, a, pro a project for uh, mitigation, restoration, etc., that we cannot understand, how will we trust it? What what aspect of it do you would we not understand? Do you do you sort of think? Um, I, I'm not sure. I, it's it's the the. Qu the question of understanding is also kind of an interest is an is is a complicated one, um, in that you know there's forms of deep learning where it works and we don't know why it works, um, you know at, at the same time if you were to ask a person how it is that you think, you know like where how do your memories work and how do your thought works and where you know like we, we don't entirely understand how we work, um, but I, I think to a greater or less I, I think to you know more important sense that, you know. Many of the, I, again, I think that in a greater sense, it's not about the need to produce fantastic, magic new technologies that are beyond the beyond the horizon of our, of our comprehension in order for them to somehow deus ex machina appear and solve everything on their own. This is, this is not at all what I, I, what, what I have in mind. And I'm deeply suspicious of those who sort of speak in those terms. What I'm speaking of is really, in many respects, a reorientation and remobilization of many of the existing technologies, existing regimes, existing processes for purposes that are, for the very long term, uh, will be will prove to be more vi will will prove to be more uh, more viable. Um, and I think that includes questions of 
what do we build computation out of? Can it continue to be built on the, the extraction of particular metals from Central Africa? What do we power it with? Can it continue to be powered by fossil fuels? Or does it need to be powered by clean energy like nuclear or, or, or solar or wind? You know, all these kinds of things. These are, these are not just, uh, you know, th these, are, these are not just short-term sort of issues. They, want, they have to do with the question, the more fundamental question of going back to that big nature video at the beginning of as, as the planet has produced one form of matter, which is human brains, that are capable of tremendous feats of sapience that have in turn produced another form of matter, which is this inorganic planetary crust that is planetary scale computation. Uh, knowing that, you know, the rare earth hypothesis is true and that life is incredibly rare, that civilizations are incredibly rare, the long-term vocation of this technology has to be one for the, has to be one that is geared towards um, the, the vibrance, the vibrancy and viability and long-term continuance um, of, of, of life on earth and probably life off of earth as well. Uh, and so again, it's not about a magic technology that's going to save everything that we don't understand. Uh, I have a lot, ultimately I have a lot of faith in what uh, a general sapience uh, is capable of doing. Well, on that note, and- um, Is that four and minutes? Did I make it? Oh, yes, you did. <laughs> we okay, have to good. give way to our special guests. And I think uh, we're going to start Wonderful. with Mija, who is in Amsterdam. Hi, hi Mija. Hey, hi, Martin. Hi, <laughs> Benjamin. Hi, how are you? Um, perfect. Busy days, but anyway, <laughs> it's a really oh. nice conversation uh and really yes. opened uh, a lot of questions and a lot of entry points um however i have one angle <laughs> uh to open and to mm -hmm. maybe challenge you a bit uh especially from the angle of comparative planetology um this mm -hmm. idea of a singular unified uh idea of a planet uh that kind of uh also emerged through the planetary uh, computation, like quite early described by uh, Paul Edwards, uh, since it was, I mean, it is a product of environmental scientists. Um, I mean, on one side, researching, uh, I mean, first starting with the weather and then going into climate and then uh, trying to understand the environment as a, I mean, especially a planetary environment as a unified system. So something that relates to everything. Uh, uh, so we have the, the earth system theory where oceans impact mm -hmm. uh, atmosphere, atmosphere, and, uh, and uh, let's say biosphere, they all relate somehow to each other. Uh, and that's a kind of idea that we should and all agree on one idea of a planet. Um, and then this uh, planetary computer is part of this planetary Im imaginary. So this one system, one idea. However, <laughs> what we are observing, and maybe this is the topic that uh, was also partially opened by uh, the last biennial in uh, Taipei, uh, where Bruno Latour was co-curating, <clears throat> coming up with the title, me and you don't live on the same planet. Uh, I, identifying that uh, different people have totally different ideas of the planet. And these ideas are so different that uh, are so confronting to each other that uh, literally <clears throat> it's not about different ideas of a planet, but literally they have idea that live on different planets. Some live on the mm -hmm. flat planets and they are so sure, like we are sure that the planet is round. So uh, in this challenge, or let's say, uh, it's not just about different human ideas, also, let's say, plants, trees, bacteria, they also had their own worldviews, they also had their own cosmologies about the environment and the planet that they live on. Mm. And then when... Yep we also leave our planet and we go to the moon or Mars, 
where we assume there are some leftovers of some other <laughs> lives as well. <laughs> Maybe there was other ideas of those planets. So coming back yeah. to the question, is there a chance for a mutual ground or a middle ground between these different perspectives, mm -hmm. between these different challenging worldviews, uh, where the planetary computation doesn't take the environment only as an object of observation, but also as a co-designer of the of this machine. So where bacteria mm -hmm. and trees can also contribute and use this machine for their own agency. Can yes. this planetary okay. machine also be used for the citizens? So that's the main question here. Yeah, great. So, okay, great. Thank you for the question because it, it gives me a, 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 a really, it's an excellent question. It gives me a very precise opportunity to sort of clarify some of the thoughts and maybe make some differentiations between our project and, and Latour's, for example. Um, let me ask you though, do, do, I mean, do you think that the people who believe in a flat earth live on a flat earth? Do you think they live on a, a round or do you think that you, they live on a spherical earth for real? Like, are they literally on flat earths or are they literally actually on spherical earths and only think they're on flat earths? It's, I, it's, I, it's a simple question, but maybe one that goes to the heart of this. Um, so I don't know. Uh, because I'm not <laughs> uh, one of them. So it's hard for me to represent their own way of thinking. Um, no, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, of, I mean, or, I mean or, actually, or lack of it. So, I, I don't mean in yeah. their way of thinking. I mean, like outside. Like, yeah, I mean, but, but because some people actually, actually live in very narrow in, uh, surroundings and context. So they don't move far. They're not mobile, right? Uh, so I understand. They, they actually, but, but, they actually don't care. They don't care, <laughs> but they believe right. that. And also, but history, they believe that, right? But different beliefs, yeah. For so, sure, hundred percent. I, 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 we, the way, the way I would describe this is they actually is that we actually live in different worlds, not so much different planets. But and this is what and, and like, I will, be, I will go out on a limb and say even flat earthers actually live on spherical planets. Whether they realize they live on spherical planets or not, they actually, for real, live on a spherical planet. But that they imagine, but that their world, in the same in which like a plants have a world, bees have a world, that all forms of things that have some, you know, von Uch schools kind of force, like that, that the world in which they live in is one in which their 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 sort of uh, their concept of their sense of location. Is one in which they they imagine themselves to live on a flat world, but that they don't. That is, and so I, I I'm enough of a kind of naive scientific realist uh, to hold that heliocentrism is a better model, is a more accurate model of the solar system than geocentrism is. That Darwinian evolution is a more accurate model of of how humans evolved, how humans got here than creationism. That the 4.6 billion year date for the age of the planet is more accurate than the 10,000 year date that that most of Europe, you know, that Christendom thought it was sort of like that. That there, that part of what Copernican traumas are is our moments, our, our priceless, priceless moments in which are in which the, our, the the form, the capacities of perception and self conception. And modeling of our of, of our worlds, that we produce some kind of a capacity for technical alienation, usually, like microscopes or telescopes, which, when used properly, allow us to something is disclosed, something is revealed about an underlying reality that has always been there. And so this is where it's like. When Paul, Paul Edwards' story about the history of the of planetarity from from uh, Earth science, uh, or the 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 uh, the discourse of planetary that emerges from space programs, I'm thinking about you know Heidegger freaking out looking at a picture of the Earth from outer space. The the planet these were moments where a, a, a planetarity is disclosed. It was revealed more than it is more than it is something that is discursively composed by certain kinds of things. And this is where I, I, I find in, in many respects, I mean, Latour, 
will he'll tell you he will you know keep adamantly tell you that he's not a social constructivist but at the end of the day at the end of the day saying that that in respects that the flat earthers literally live on another planet that the that the spherical earthers live live on another planet i find the fact that he's that he's so willing to let go of the idea that there actually is and that there actually is a planet from which from which humans have emerged from which human capacity for sentience and sapience has emerged that uh, that it it is it is part of which that all of the form that that the let go of the idea that planets make worlds so that he can hold on to the idea that worlds make planets i find totally disingenuous totally uh politically reprehensible uh and intellectually fraudulent but maybe just last challenge uh is there sure you can see me more you... questions have <laughs> just a short one so but other than that i like him computed <laughs> is the computed earth is the computed earth so the one that is a product of the computation yeah. i mean today it's usually sure, described sure, sure, as, sure. A di as a digital twin is that really yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, right so, so, so let me ask it so, so part of the idea that so i think one of the, the sort of the ideological mistakes of the of the early computing era as well was somehow the idea that computation is virtual and 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 as opposed and that and the analog processors biological processors are physical and that it's a dynamic between the physical and the virtual computation is a physical process computation is a physical process it's a bending and folding of metals and minerals running electricity through it and so forth and so on and so the question of the fact that we would ask the question of how that can can planetary computation act back upon the earth in a way in which the earth is combined kind of is based on an idea that somehow it's not part of the earth to begin with it it, it planetary scale computation is one of the things that the earth does now the fact that it 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 makes sense and model and 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 and, and that is first of all makes use of all of the kinds of matter and energy of the earth for it to function is one thing but but i think to the heart of your question which i think is 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 a is an excellent one is what are the ways in which um, are, are there other forms are there other ways in which lots of different forms of life can not only be the kind of object of observation of this apparatus but actually can be enrolled in this apparatus in ways that are more generative and i this is exactly the right question to ask one of the areas that i'm really interested in for this particular purpose is, is the role of of deep learning in synthetic biology uh, where you see labs to where you've got you've got huge arrays of 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 different kinds of uh, of experiments that are, that are being done where you've got whether it's you've got different kinds of uh, whether you know whether the the the, the, the material of these experiments are are, are, are cells or sort of something smaller than theirs at a molecular level, but that you've set up a kind of computational apparatus that is doing a kind of possibility testing of different kinds of, 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 of developmental forms upon, upon this matter. What you've set up in a way is certain kind of matter producing another kind of matter and then describing the matter that is kind of produced. And like, we've kind of like set the dominoes going, but really what you've got is like matter making matter in a way in which that may result in some you know drug therapies but other kinds of other kinds of things as well but you know thinking about think about ways in which other kinds of fundamental or fundamental planetary processes of photosynthesis of cellular regeneration of other kinds of things that can actually be somehow kind of micro prostheticized by uh by by uh, some kind of informational te information technology is it, to me, it, it, a way of thinking about what some information technology might really be for, might really be useful for. And so I, I love this, I love this line of thinking. I love the way in which it kind of develops as a sort of, as a way of possibilities of thinking about computation as a landscape scale phenomenon, rather than a kind of, you know, a machine, rather than a kind of a vir machine that makes vir virtual images, that it's an imminent physical process that is interrelated with biological and chemical processes at its core. That is, that's, that's, I think that's the direction we want to be thinking through for sure.
So I certainly hope so, and I love it as an orientation for us. Yeah. So we now have uh, the next question from our next guest, Milos, who is, I think, in Ljubljana. Hi, Milos. Hi. Hi, that's correct. Hi. Um, thanks so much for this talk. Uh, I think it was fascinating, um, especially uh, in a sense that I'm an architect as well. So I'm thinking a lot about... I have to say, uh, I'm, not an, I'm not an architect. I just I just pretend to be one at, when I teach at architecture schools, I'm, but I don't design anything. We all do, I think. Uh, um, okay. <laughs> it's, um, it, it definitely addresses uh, a construct or, or rather a... Um, a certain problem that is so present in architecture, perhaps even more than in other disciplines right now, um, and that is certain paralysis in how to act and especially how to plan, how to plan hmm. and how to construct and to organize any sort of totality, let alone the, for instance, planetary totality. And I always think that um, there is certain connection between this paralysis in the world that's overwhelmed with data um, and the contrast to it, for instance, with white patches um, on maps of the 15th and 16th century, which was not only the amount of data was way smaller, but the knowledge of the limitation was very much present and almost tangible. And yet the mm -hmm. ability to plan and control was something completely different to our contemporary paralysis. And I suppose I'm trying to ask you whether you think that the, the ability to control infrastructure rather to use it against the grain uh, for which it was constructed, which is a lot of what we were, we were um, hearing today, is somehow linked mm -hmm. to establishing a new common sense um, in line with how neoliberalism and um, or surveillance capitalism built the common sense that even the um, the forces that are trying to oppose it have to deal with as the common sense. I'm, I will I will um, yeah. illustrate what I mean here. Um, for instance, with, I very much like that you um, you talked about um, you know questioning some of the basic assumptions, um, and we're talking about nationalization of um, uh, the data networks, for instance, or the the data infrastructure. Um, and we do seem to focus a lot about global tax, um, the notion of nationalization and uh, the na nation control, um, instead of perhaps mm -hmm. thinking of how to redefine the notion of um, ownership in general as to make it inoperative or rather operative in another way. So instead of playing on the opponent's field, so to speak, um, is it mm -hmm. possible to address the very notion that uh, that defines the rules of the game. I mean, and other examples, which I very much like the, um, the talk about borders, you know, in, in which borders perhaps are like to um, computation that you um, um, stress. There's always also, it's not an abstract uh, process. Uh, borders are likewise never just a line. You know? They are a line as an abstraction, but in space, they always exist, they always have depth, um, they always have space, and that's where rules, na national rules at the very least, don't apply. So I'm, I'm just trying to get to the point, um, is it possible to expand these uncovered territories and make them into a new um, mainstream in a way, to make them inoperative? Hmm. So thank you. It's a, it's a number of really interesting questions sort of linked together into one question. So I'm, I'll try to answer, uh, try to sort of also tie my, my responses together as much as I, as, as much as I can. Um, the, I think that there is a need for a kind of, uh, a, a different common sense, um, in, in relation to this. And I think this is part of what we're talking about. We're, we're talking about here in terms of the, this question of what planetary scale computation um, is for. Um, to the point at the beginning about totality, uh, which you speak to, is that I, I think one of the, one of the, I think m maybe also again shifting some of the common sense here, is to a certain extent there's a there's a presumption that totality becomes the, the plan is predicated on totality and the totality is predicated on omniscience or completion 
of the map or uh, like the more higher resolution the representation the greater the capacity for planning might be and I, I and i actually don't think that's really necessarily the case right there's ways in which totalities can be that we can imagine and construct totalities and understand them in ways that are either whether those are natural totalities like you know understanding you know the the distribution of carbon dioxide or whether they're artificial totalities like metric system or time zones or something like this where they they are th these are they are systems that have been that have been that are artificially constructed first to measure the earth in some way to zone the earth in different kinds of construct kinds of constructions but because they because they're in a way enforced as artificial descriptions they have a generative capacity to actually cause things to happen in the image of the the parameters of measurement that is a metric the metric system doesn't just measure things in the world that happen to be 10 centimeters it causes things to be certain lengths and widths and heights so that they become interoperable in the future that the artificiality of these subsectionings are generative and borders are obviously one of those as well uh, in certain respects, like to some extent that they are drawn based on where, you know, different linguistic communities happen to be in the 17th century. In some cases, they are, in fact, generative of the distributions of populations in different in different in different kinds of ways. And so part of the question here has to, again has to do with is thinking about totalities, not entirely in terms of omniscience, uh, that if we can that if we can know every single thing that there is to know, then we'll know what to do. But rather thinking about totalities in terms of what are the ways in which we can construct a kind of a certain kind of artificial anthropogenic responses that we anticipate and and will will mobilize on behalf of their generative functions, uh, even if they even if in some ways that they. They're beginning as representational or descriptive, or, or descriptive functions, and, and one way to maybe think about that is again in terms of climate science. That is, climate science today is, uh, you know, is an extraordinarily accomplished description of the way uh, Earth's, you know, Earth systems operate. And you know, to the previous speaker, for sure, our simulations of our computational simulations of those processes are are many, many, many orders of magnitude much simpler and primitive than those actual processes in, in the world. That doesn't mean, however, like our climate models may be complex, but they're, they're, they are rudimentary compared to the complexity of an actual climate. That doesn't mean that they are somehow inadequate to having agency. That just because our climate models are millions of times simpler than the climate itself doesn't mean that we shouldn't act on their behalf. That doesn't mean that they don't have implications for how it is that for an anthropogenic response to anthropogenic climate change. One of the things that I think maybe we find ourselves at this point is that climate models um, have a capacity to represent the world. They do not yet have a capacity to recursively act back upon the world in ways that they should. That they don't have a they don't have a recursive and generative and, re, and generative function in the same way financial models do, for example, where financial models not only describe the market but they actually cause the market to bend in particular directions. We need we need our climate models not to be, you know, like a, a million times more high res, and therefore we'll know what to do. We need to be focusing really on like how do we make them recursive, how do we make them generative, so that this general distribution of sapience that they represent of how not just you know scientists know what's going on but how the planet understands itself and can act back upon itself and remake itself in some sort of ways through us the the uh, the willing primates uh, as their as their media or their sexual organs as the case may be uh, are, are able to uh, are able to sort of structure uh, structure upon that and so I guess then to the question of borders, um, again, it's my point earlier is, is I, I, it, I, I think it's too simple to simply say we're going to get rid of borders because I think what's going to happen then is it simply, it simply displaces the interiorization, the inclusion, exclusion functions that borders do. It simply displaces that to internal differentiation. 
So if you get rid of a, of a border at one scale, then those process of interiorization, exteriorization, inclusion, exclusion, then again, just get sort of moved inside that territory and they become displaced in a way in which the more fun, maybe some of the more fundamental issues are not, are not, necessar are not necessarily resolved. But one of the things I think we are already seeing is a kind of multiplication and overlapping of bordering systems where instead of just seeing this as here's the Mercator projection of terrestrial geography and how can we redraw the lines, we need to understand that one of the things that planetary scale computation is doing is not just redrawing the map, but it's producing new territories in its own image. It's not just redrawing the map, it's redrawing the territory and producing new territories. And so it may be, and I think it already is in many respects, that if you're standing at one place on the map, you are already both inside and outside of many different borders at the same time. Physical borders, national borders, platform borders, institutional borders, any number of kinds of ways, kinds of things as well. And so in the long term, again, I think it probably has less to do with which kind of circles can we draw on the land so that we can put people inside them in different kinds of locations, but rather how is it that that platform that that the platform that computation that the distributed platforms that are able to pr provide information to sense information across space and time in different kinds of artificial ways are able to include and uh, include in this, uh, to, to include and provide services provide access provides modes of inclusion uh that are not necessarily dependent upon uh, enclosure within a particular uh, a particular state domain, uh, I, I think, is probably where a lot of this is going. At, at the same time, it's 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 less in terms of the role of the state going forward. I think it has less to do with states disappearing, but rather the way in which states themselves are evolving into cloud platforms. Mm -hmm. And so, if you think of something like the Belt and Road Initiative that China is 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 putting forward throughout Africa and Eurasia. And into Europe, the development of this of this transnational infrastructure that allows them to sense and model and act back upon the economies and societies that this infrastructure moves through, is not an attempt to include Kazakhstan into China or to include Tanzania into China, but it's able to extend their infrastructural capacity to sense, model, and act back upon those societies and infrastructures through this th through this kind of way. And so, it, it, these I think in many cases are the kinds of the kinds of processes, the kinds of uh, the, the kinds of trends or developments where our our, our, our critical attention must hold. I, I, I'm not necessarily arguing entirely on their behalf, um, but to your point, uh, I, I want to underscore them and point to them to demonstrate, as as you suggest, some of the ways in which um, simply uh sort of uh reinscribing the borders of europe for example and saying you know that we are going to somehow contain these planetary flows inside the 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 moat uh of europe in some way and that that inside the moat will be able to control what goes on here in a certain kind of way um it, it you know is a bit like um i think it's a bit like king canute standing in front of the waves and commanding them to stop uh I think these forces just operate at a scale that's larger than that, uh, and, and so I think that the responses should be ones that are uh, that are thinking at the scale. That our responses should be ones that are thinking at the scale of the phenomena itself, not that governance should be suspended. To the contrary, to the contrary, governance should be expanded to the mm -hmm. scale of the planetary phenomenon that we are that we are that we are embedded in. You know, the recent work is a call for. A planetary governance, not a withdrawal of planetary governance. So, anyway, thank you for the excellent questions. Thanks for a great answer. Thanks. Well, I really like this um, this idea about borders expanding, not moving, but but expanding. It, it reminds me of of an essay that was published uh, some years ago. Maybe you remember it called "Welcome to Airspace." where it talked precisely mm. about like, the fiction of borders and how these new spaces that, that the planetarity has created are mostly defined by aesthetics right now. But uh, huh. now we have Marco. In, th in some cases, sometimes they're defined by, sometimes they're defined by men with guns, but I, I understand, but I you understand your point for sure. 
Yeah, yeah, but that's normally protecting something that has a very particular aesthetics, even if it's just, you know, oh. palm trees and like, you know, clean swimming pools and, and mineral water and, and stuff like that. Oh. <laughs> Okay. So, Marco, uh, so you, you've, just, you've just described La Jolla. <laughs> <laughs> hi, both. Um, hi, Benjamin. Nice hi, to Mark, see you again. You? Um, nice to see you, my I'm, friend. I'm okay. <laughs> so, to, to get uh, local about it, while translating the terraforming into Slovenian, actually, a Slovenian government became uh, what you would call an idiotic ethno nationalist government with some. A fine finesses of extra right um, women, but um, my my problem was, uh, or my my dilemma was connecting that to your anti culture stance in from the terraforming, because the of course the knee jerk uh, reaction to such a government is a cultural one, right? It's it's an instant culture war, but culture war of course is uh, exactly part of the problem, and mm -hmm. uh, also the knee jerk reaction from the left is a cultural one and it's also technophobic uh, so very much mm. against technology very much against science or at least not not so very much against science but it has like this you know like reaction against government is also like a reaction against against uh doing schools via zoom you know things like that <laughs> so in that regard i was thinking about um relationship between uh prosaic and poetic because we, we are like a nation of mm. poets like our heroes mm. are poets not 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 so much scientists or technocrats <laughs> and, and 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 the thing is that for sure if if if, some, if one reads your work uh, one gets an impression one needs more manuals than poetry works uh, but at the, but at the same time to get back to kafka He's exactly the figure that sort of mediates between the uh, poetic and prosaic. And I would also say mm. that your role within that or your function is actually still about mediating between culture and technology. So that mm. would be my question. Hmm. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. Um... So I should probably say that you know my my I, I wouldn't characterize my position as anti-culture. I, I would care any more than I would cons really cons characterize my position as pro-technology. That was like um, contrarian, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I got what the particular point I was making in the book, just to maybe clarify for the listeners, was that there is, I think, in that more kind of uh, the kind of r romantic left anti anti-technology anti kind of knee-jerk response that I think you're speaking to, a kind of, a, a kind of uh, a flamboyant valorization of culture as the antidote to the ills of technology. And, an under, and, and it, based upon it, in a way, a very deeply seated dichotomization between the two, that technical reason and aesthetic reason are at odds with each other, and that they are fundamentally fundamentally distinct that they are uh that that they that they represent not only different approaches but antagonistic approaches uh and that there's a kind of fundamental there's a sort of fundamental war in the astral realm between the dark side of the force and the light side of the force and 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 and, and, and so on and, and in the west this goes back to at least to the romantic era and the kind of the kind of, I, I think in many ways, um, it, uh, disoriented response to the, just to, you know, the disclosures of electricity and surgery, uh, and, 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 you know, industrialization and so forth. And, and the, the, the production of an idea of a poetic disposition an artistic response, a kind of transcendental autonomy from, the technical and the instrumental and the machinic that you know finds its and and certainly absolutely a kind of in many ways hysterical response to the implications of darwin that it's, you know that finds its apotheosis in in nietzsche who you know took the idea of man as animal in a way that that was uh 
you know, says more about his concept of what animals are than anything else. And 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 then, of course, in Heidegger, for whom the you know, in a way, kind of the 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 penultimate uh, uh, d declaration of this, and in in many ways, as you and I have discussed, a, a project that is in in many respects a kind of way of t attempting to tell the history of being without ever mentioning darwin without with a history of trying to recapture and refortify and 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 extend a pre-darwinian understanding of what it means to be human as long as as long as possible and so what i mean by this is that this 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 distinction the dichotomization and the valorization of the cultural and the aesthetic and the artistic over instrumental reason is not is is less the position by which the the logic of technology in the west can be resisted and overcome then it is fundamentally the basis of the logic of the philosophy of technology in the west going back hundreds of years the logic of the philosophy of western philosophy of technology is this is this distinction and dichotomization um and and the and the, the valorization of one in relationship to the other now w one of the ways in which i suppose think of this is 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 Again, not that it's a, a, try, a an attempt to try to demystify or disenchant or denigrate the the poetic or the artistic or the aesthetic. I, I think these these themselves are also priceless forms of are of sapient abstraction that appear, you know, sixty thousand years ago with the rest of the cognitive revolution and that, that manifested in the forms of of figural abstraction. Uh, an externalization of cognition in the forms of images and models of representation. Like this is a fundam this is so fundamental to to this project of general sapience to which I to which I describe that it's impossible to separate them at all. At the same time, you know, when I'm at my primary professorship is at UC San Diego, which is University of California San Diego, which is a, a kind of a science and technology university that is, focuses on neuroscience and biotechnology. Uh, and computational biology and 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 so forth, and many nanoengineering. In many cases, when I do lab visits and I go to see what someone in the bioengineering department is working on, when they're building tiny little machines for the filtering of of white blood cells that go inside the inside the veins and and are doing something like inter. I look at the work that goes on in the lab and I think this by far is the best art on campus. That what we're doing over in the art department is not nearly as good as art as what a lot of the as what's going on in the nanoengineering department or in the bioengineering department. So if they don't think of it that way, you know, try to explain this to them why this is actually so wonderful in this sort of way, and they kind of they sort of smile and and say thank you, um, but they don't really understand why this why this would why this would this would why this would be the case. Um, and so I guess in a certain way, if, if, if you see my role as a kind of mediator between these two, it's probably one in which there, it, it would be one that it's, a, it, you know, the quixotic attempt to de-Heideggerize the philosophy of technology, which it might be, you know, probably beyond, beyond my capacity and all, and, and all the things that that would imply. But one of the things that it would imply is an understanding and appreciation of the poetic, aesthetic, allegorical complexity and beauty of technical and machinic reason and composition at, in, in, in and of itself. And to understand those processes themselves as not as something that is antithetical to the poetic, but as a manifestation of, of, the, of, of the poetic. And, and going back to the Marta's analogy at the beginning of humans as the sexual organs of machine, that you know, a all the sort of forms of dynamics of desire that 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 constitute the basis of of of, of cultural energy, are also manifest in are also manifest in there as well. You know, aesthetic, aesthetic reason is a form of pattern recognition. It's a form of 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 cross domain heuristic uh, heuristic communication. It's all kinds of things. It's incredibly complex and. I, I would never want to, you know, never want to do away with it and never want to denigrate it. But I would also never want to not be able to see it in what I take to be its most 
amazing manifestations in the contemporary world, which in many cases are ones that are deeply technological uh, in, 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 their, in their origins and deeply instrumental in their function. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this dichotomy you were talking about is, is the same one that uh, Charles Mann describes in his, I think, last or second to last book uh, called um, uh, Prophets and Visionaries, no? Like what's prophets. that book? Is that the one about... Uh, what's the t I don't yeah. know this book. What's the topic? Oh, it's called Prophets and Visionaries, I think. And it talks about precisely this dichotomy uh, between uh, the, the scientists or in general, the thinkers that see the world as something that can be fixed or um, improved through technology and through human mm. means. Uh, and those that believe that uh, it should be left alone uh, to regain its natural, uh, you know, state of uh, perfection, I guess, uh, to put hmm. to extreme. Okay. Uh, most of the, I would say that most of the scientists that most of the scientists that I know uh, are, are are wouldn't agree with that position. Wouldn't wouldn't say wouldn't necessarily agree with that position. Some of the engineers that I know would see the world that's that way but i you know scientists not necessarily but it, it, yeah i mean yeah. And, you know there's cp snow and the two cultures what i was really speaking up to what was not so much the dichotomization of this was that it was really more specifically to the dynamics of this dichotomization in the western philosophy of technology and why in many respects the philosophy of technology that the planetary philosophy of technology that we really need to be composing for the next 100 years to decolonize that philosophy, to de-Westernize that philosophy means to allow for this Heideggerian commitment to slide away. Yeah, I wish I could keep talking about this, uh, but okay. we have Nadia uh, waiting to uh, to read some of the questions from the audience. So hi Nadia, how are you doing? Hi Marta, I'm doing great. You? Hello. Hello, Perfect. hello, Benjamin. Yeah, thank you, Marta. Thank you, Benjamin, for this eye-opening discussion. And a big thanks to our online audience posing so many wonderful questions in the chat. We have selected three questions today. The first one being by Mikal. Uh, pretty sure I'm not pronouncing this correctly. They ask, Benjamin, how do you see a relation between reorientation of planetary scale computation and existing market forces? As I see it, they add, a lot of means of computation are in private sector, which could not be happy about the individualization of data or reorientation of computation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so let's let's be careful. Let, uh, it's an excellent question. Let's be specific about what how I, I'll, I'll try to be specific about how I might try to answer that. Um, the not all of planetary scale computation is pri not all of planetary scale computation is privately owned. A lot of it is, is owned and controlled by states. Um, a lot of it is, you know, something organized by other kinds of non-government or or organizations. And I, I think, in a certain extent, you know, I, again, sort of reshifting our focus a little bit of thinking about the Asian context, not as an anomalous. No, an anomaly of the North American and European context, but one that in fact might be more central and primary. The question about um, the question about how can we ensure that there is public and state control of the infrastructure uh, is not is 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 a question that you don't is, is a question that seems to have been answered to a to to a more or less degree. No, very few of my friends in China who study the internet say what we need is more public state control of the internet. Um, it, and so my point then is that one of the ways in which we should probably be thinking about the geoeconomics of planetary scale computation going forward is probably one in which the forms of ownership and the forms of control and the forms of capitalization of these investments and these purposes and these uh, and and the the functions of this are probably ones that will not be entirely recognizable to kind of mid twentieth century Keynesian 
distinctions between public ownership and private ownership in the same way in which it's very difficult to, to decide exactly whether contemporary China is a communist society or a capitalist society. It's clearly both. And it's clearly something something other than what those were at the, other than what those were, uh, other than what those were at 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 the beginning, but I think the gist of the of the person's question is isn't the, isn't the logic of market control of these predicated on profit and profit extraction, and won't and, and to a greater degree won't profit extraction necessarily lead it towards short-term and pathological applications of the of pathological functions of these platforms and uh it it, it very well may be in many in, in many in many cases um at, at the same time it's clear that that uh that that state control and state ownership of of these infrastructures um uh, is not necessarily the would not necessarily provide for the inversion of all of the pathologies of the of the market of the market forces either. Many of the things that we might observe in in the Chinese context as most troubling about the Chinese model of the of the internet are not things that are being necessarily driven by um, the short term quarterly mm -hmm. profit. Uh, qu quarterly profit demands for Tencent or Alibaba, they're driven by demands of this, they're driven by demands of the state. Uh, and so once again, it's like the versions of this that we need to be able to sort of look towards are ones in which we're very clear about, we're, we're very sort of clear eyed about the limitations of, 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 of uh, investment capital driven platforms. We're clear about the limitations of centralized state driven platforms. But we're also clear about the limitations of sort of anarchic, decentralized, distributed networks uh, that might, uh, in many cases, uh, uh, be much more nimble at the edges, but also have uh, less of a capacity for long-term, uh, less of a capacity for long-term planning, um, because they have less of a capacity for the recursive verticality that I'm calling for. Um, and in relation to the climate science, if they do, if they if they are proved capable of this, then this is this is wonderful. And so that's why in many cases, such intelligent people are looking at models of ownership along those lines, of trying to think about ways that are neither uh, state led or corporate led, but might be ones that are uh, as generally distributed as as for example, you know, we think about the scientific the global scientific community and the way in which climate science has been constructed in a way in which is largely decentralized um on the one hand but also uh driven by centralized state uh investment and entrepreneurial investment in the forms of grants in the forms of research in the forms of other kinds of things and so something along this is again you know something along these lines is maybe where we want to sort of to look where if you see what if you see what i'm saying the kind of the distribution of the distribution of information within the scientific community is is largely uh, flat and decentralized, but the fact that this research has been able to be conducted in the first place is the result of massive, massive central central investment from from state uh, state scientific uh, state scientific institutes. And so, some we need to think about some kind of 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 of, of logic, and we need to find some other kinds of models uh, that may perhaps along these lines. Thank you for this elaborate answer. Our second question. I'm sorry if it's too elaborate. From... Maybe I, I, I could have said it simpler, more simply. So. Oh, it's great. Our second question uh, comes from Peter. They ask, how does the smart city concept resonate with or against the planetary computation perspective? If at all, how does the urban rural divide come into play here? Mm -hmm. So the city is a, I mean, the city is an amazing technology, isn't it? I mean, one of the, the wonderful, I mean, one of the really amazing things about cities is, is their durability, that, they, that cities last longer than the regimes that build them. Uh, and, and cities as, and the cities that we're in now will last longer than the regimes that we live under at, the, at this moment. C city, cities as forms of collective prosthetic technology persist over generations in ways that um, political regimes d political regimes do not. Cities have long been a way in which sort of past decisions about how it is that we might live together and occupy a particular place get encoded and built into 
uh, the occupiable hardware of the site. And in, and in this way, cities decide and enforce these decisions long term. And they can do so in ways that are sort of prosaic, like I turn on the faucet and water comes out. I don't have, they don't have to have a meeting of the local water authority to decide whether I should have water. It's just, it's that it's built in. It already happens. Or like, are we living near the river, far away from the river? Like all these, these sort of ways in which we have long-term intergenerational decisions about the coextensive technology of place get built into cities. And so, you know, cities are, you know, again, you know, the, a, a wonderful, wonderful model for the sort of collective collective technology. And then it would stand to reason that in this regard, that to the extent to which, to the extent to which planetary, and, and, and that is that cities are already very, very smart. It's not as though that once we would introduce planetary, introduce computation into the hardware of cities, that therefore cities will become intelligent or thereby cities will be made smart. Cities are already much smarter than, many other kinds of things, many other sorts of things. Well, and yet, if we can introduce forms of, of ways in which different moments and interfaces and apertures and surfaces and boundaries within the city are able to sense what's happening in their proximity and are able to model this in, ag in aggregate and are able to recursively act back upon the implications of those models, that the ability for us to self-organized through cities in ways that would otherwise be prohibitively difficult for political or economic reasons seems totally plausible. The problem that I have, and that would sort of suggest that there's something to the smart city idea. However, the problem that I really have with the smart city sort of idea is, is not that it's too grandiose or too, too you know, unrealistically utopian, but in fact that it's totally unimaginative at its core and totally lacking in any kind of lack, lacking in any kind of aspirational vision of what a city can be in most cases there are simply ways in which a, a kind of the most myopic and rudimentary understanding of how a city would work reduced to functions of shopping and parking and 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 turnstiles and and, and so forth and then thinking about ways in which this extremely reductive and reduced and 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 stultifyingly boring concept of a city could be computationally excel computationally accelerated. So I, I would make us in my mind. I, I think of the, the 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 role of computation in the augmentation of the existing intelligence of cities and the conventional smart city discourse. Which is a kind of just a kind of rote uh, reinscription of an increasingly reductive and dull notion of, of 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 occupation as two totally different kinds of directions and projects, two different directions for what how computation can be embedded in, embedded into place, uh, and so this is, and, and so I, I would see it in, in in this kind of way. At the same time, you know, one finds interesting ideas in on, in strange places. Uh, you know, I, there. I, I happened to visit the the World AI Expo in Shanghai a couple of years ago, and the which took over the site of the World's Fair. The entire World's Fair site was devoted to different kinds of AI platforms and products and schemes, and most of them were focused on cities. And I would say that ninety percent of them were not frightening. They were uh, they were frightening only in the sense that they were stultifyingly dull. But there's ten percent of them that were, in some weird, upside down way, quite ingenious. Uh, and I think, you know, I, you know, my attention in a certain way is to is to try to find something interesting in these kind of unlikely and perverse spaces, and to and to think about ways in which they could be, uh, you know, they might suggest uh, they might suggest clues for what for what comes next, uh, despite themselves. Thank you. Now for our third and last question, Iska or Jiska asks, in your view, will there still be politi political leaders in planetary politics? How do we think politics in a planetary approach? Mm. Thanks. Um, yes, I think so. Uh, but I, I would, I would make a, 
I can, I would make try to make a distinct. There, there has been since since Foucault at least a distinction between you know the political and governance, and and to a certain extent. You know, political. You know, we think of Schmitz and Chantal Mouffe and these kinds of more, a kind of metaphysical distinction between friend and enemy that's antagonistic, that is kind of that is metaphysical and ontological and combative. Um, and in, in the West, to a certain, into into whereas governance is the kind of mundane decision making, the 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 more the less personalized ways in which decision gets embedded into processes and protocols and interfaces and infrastructures such that the political doesn't have to happen. And my example of, of, of the water tap is sort of my go-to example for this, that there is in, in, in a kind of fundamental sense, a kind of po politics of water distribution for sure. And yet most of us don't experience this. And we're very glad that we don't experience this, that we're glad that we don't have to have some kind of antagonistic debate about whether or not you know where the water should go this morning but we're, we're glad that governance has been built into the infrastructure in such a way that it, it, it sort of just works and i don't see this as a depoliticization i see it in a way as the realization of a successful politicization in such a way that we can move on we, we in a way move on to other things so this is a bit of his way of saying is that I, I do think that the political will continue at a planetary scale. If we think of the political as a kind of clash of ideas, a kind of clash of positions, social positions in relationship to different kinds of productive forces, you know, I, I, we're nowhere near the end of history in that kind of regard. But at the same time, I also think that in many ways, there's a, the, there is also a perhaps equally interesting discussion about planetary governance which is not necessarily the same thing as planetary politics that may have to do with other kinds of embedded infrastructural dynamics such as such as carbon taxes such as carbon capture such as different kinds of energy infrastructures such as a reorgan such as the life as it exists after a reorganization of borders and a reconceptualization uh, of citizenship uh, and so forth and so on um, all of these things might be what well, all of these things might be experienced as dynamics of governance more than they are experienced as dynamics of politics per se, especially because politics, as such, with a capital P, is so invested in symbolic contestation, in a contestation and clash of symbols, and and what what Marco called the kind of cultural narratives, the kind of cultural war, in which the war over the semiotic representation of the real becomes more important than the real itself. And I, I think to the extent that this happens, we, we find our, we, in, in any case, we find ourselves in a, way, in a place in which uh, an equitable and viable governance becomes less, uh, become, becomes less likely. Um, and at last point, I, I think that you know, since the you know, last generation or so, I think since the beginning of that neoliberal era, where in the West, Governance in general has been denigrated as something sort of obscene and and uh, and profane, you know. With in the, in the extent to which techno technocracy has, these, you know, is a technocrat is a slur, um, whereas the political with a capital P is 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 um, is 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 amplified and and uh, elevated. As a kind of a, a kind of profound vocation uh, over the nature of uh, uh, the nature of the real in Asia it, it, over the last same period, beginning in seventy eight, when Deng comes comes back and assumes power in China, there may have been the inverse of this, where governance and, and the competency of governance became a priority, whereas the political as an ideological contestation over the nature of these things was 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 sidelined for sure and and, and not necessarily in, in, in good ways but um i do think that there's a role for politics going forward i am interested in kinds of pl uh, transnational planetary political parties transnational planetary platforms agendas thinking about you know thinking about the green new deals and all these you know, one of the interesting things about the green new deal despite all of its kind of its obvious limitations is it's a shift in the logic of governance from 
the mediation of general will and general voice to the, the purpose of government is the management of ecosystems and the assurance of their long-term viability. And the fact that they are have the different kinds of transnational imaginaries suggests in one way or another. So yes to planetary politics, but don't forget planetary governance. All right. Well, as you can see, uh, we are all intensely interested in how this uh, architecture will be governed. And uh, maybe from your last intervention, I almost presume that maybe this uh, burst of ultra national uh, politics uh, is a manifestation of the end of nationalism and national politics. Sure, maybe. Uh, that would yeah. be. That's yeah, th th things that yeah, things burn brightest just as as they're about to disappear. Exactly, like a swan song, like in Pompeii, and um, and so I think uh, this is a wrap. <laughs> so thank you, oh. thank you so much. Thank you, Marta. Thank, thank you so much. Your um, your brain is fantastic. I hope we can have it. Uh, <laughs> often <laughs> in this uh in the uh axioma series and uh thank you everyone else for uh listen and watch and ask and i'll see you next month bye thanks benjamin thanks marta and thanks also to our guests in the studio and to all of you who decided to follow us and contribute to this conversation through the web chat Reprogramming has been conceived for the 10th edition of Tactics and Practice, the series of seminars and conferences organized by Axioma Institute for Contemporary Art Ljubljana in partnership with Kino Shishka. The event is realized in the framework of CONS platform for contemporary investigative arts. Reprogramming returns on April 19th at 7 p.m. Central European time with a new episode dedicated to energy. With us, there will be the American geographer, designer, environment making Holly Chin Buck, the author of After Geoengineering, a book about best and worst case scenarios for deliberately intervening in the climate and why we should reimagine carbon removal technologies. To stay up to date on our programs, events, and publications, follow us on social media or subscribe to our YouTube and Vimeo channels. That's all for today. Greetings from Ljubljana. Nasvidenja. Thank mm -hmm. you.